Hi, my name is Greg Maloney from Sydney, Australia. I work in private practice at the Mossman Eye Centre and uh, in public practice at um, Sydney Eye Hospital. All my work in this area is uh, funded by the Sydney Eye Hospital Foundation and current trials are sponsored by Sydney University. The purpose of this video is to share our experiences with um, a decimator excess without endothelial keratoplasty or DWEC. I'm going to also share some animations and some um, surgical videos that will hopefully help um, any doctors out, th out there contemplating this operation and, and maybe help them communicating with, uh, with your patients a as well. Um, uh, we've been uh, using this operation as part of our treatment algorithm in fixed dystrophy for around the last four years with um, generally uh, positive results uh, and we do feel it has a role. Um, here is a photo of our first patient done who remained stable four years post-surgery. I'm often asked who we feel are candidates for the procedure <coughs> and at the moment we feel this is for patients with fixed dystrophy uh, who suffer from debilitating glare or difficulty night driving, a reduction in best spectacle corrected vision in around the 2030 to 2080 range usually, um, uh, patients with uh, focal edema in the setting of FUX with a clear periphery. Uh, and critical to the operation is that there is a, um, a healthy peripheral endothelial cell reserve. Uh, we measure that in all patients with a confocal uh, microscopy prior to surgery, um, but an exact cutoff for cell count is, is yet to be defined. Um, arbitrarily, we, we accept patients uh, with uh, more than a thousand uh, cells countable, um, but um, patients, it's likely that patients with less than this would possibly still have some success. Um, they should otherwise be contemplating a DMEC and lens status doesn't matter, phakic or uh, pseudophakic. I think it's worth <coughs> discussing for a second the rationale behind the operation and um, to cover that um, there are two concepts that I think have, have um, uh, opened up this operation as an intervention. The first is that uh, during the evolution of endothelial keratoplasty uh, there have been many case reports um, of spontaneous clearing of uh, corneas despite non-attached DMEC grafts from the Mellis group. And there's also been for many years case reports of spontaneous clearing of uh, decimose defects in the setting of cataract surgery or other intraocular surgery um, without the placement of a graft. Uh, this uh, led has led many surgeons to the um, logical next step which is um, if Guttata themselves are responsible for creating a reduction in visual quality can they be removed selectively without transplanting a graft and can we rely on that healing capacity of the endothelium to um, clear the cornea? That of course will be variable between patients <coughs> and um, that's the, the main challenge now that we're, we're facing with this operation is that predictability of endothelial healing in each setting or in, with each patient. With respect to the study of Gattata, there's a very <coughs> uh, useful video that's on, available on the Cornea Society uh, uh, webpage from the Shepherd's Eye Institute um, demonstrating that there is a certain size of Gattata across which the endothelium will be unable to form a monolayer. Um, if the Gattata on the inner surface of the cornea are small enough then the endothelial cells can cover over that defect but if or that um, excrescence but if that uh, Gattata gets to a, a large enough size then they will aggregate ar around the edges. <coughs> Uh, that's visible even on light microscopy where you can see endothelial cells draping themselves over um, Gattata of a certain size. That contortion of endothelial cell uh, morphology is visible <coughs> when you look at um, uh, endothelial cells migrating across a, a posterior corneal defect. Here we see cells migrating over des a decimeterexus margin which cannot be more than 10 to 15 micrometers in size but still induces a large stretching uh, and um, uh, elongation of the endothelial cell cytoplasm and it's not difficult to imagine that that has to be a finite uh, capacity. So aggregated Gattata will cause um, light scatter, glare uh, and blur, um, reduction in visual quality. Um, aggregated Gattata of a large enough size will disrupt the endothelial monolayer and cause uh, focal edema and it's the removal of those Gattata uh, that's that's critical to visual rehabilitation in Fuchs dystrophy uh, in these early stages. That animation uh, we found useful by the way in communicating this surgery to patients and that's uploaded as, as a separate um, video if anyone wishes to, to show that. Um. When we began this operation we became quite excited 
by um, the detection of what we felt were mitotic bodies in the peripheral uh, uh, cornea. On confocal microscopy, we saw numerous um, quadrants demonstrating bilobe nuclei, segmenting cytoplasm, hyperchromatic nuclei that we felt might indicate that we were triggering some mitotic ability by removal of cell-cell contact inhibition with this operation. Time and analysis of peripheral endothelial cell counts would show that um, uh, in almost, well, in all cases of, of DWIC, um, uh, the uh, endothelial cell counts trend downwards, so it's mainly migration of cells to the centre to cover this defect that is the um, healing force rather than uh, mitosis and, and, and creation of new cells. And that just highlights uh, the need for a peripheral endothelial cell reserve for this surgery to uh, work. Moving on then to discuss how we do the surgery. When we commenced this, this operation you wouldn't think that there were many technical points necessary uh, to, to learn uh, with doing a desmetorexis, it's a step we're all familiar with, but um, what we've come to realise is that the surgical factors are in fact um, probably very important in determining the outcome of the operation. Um, firstly, limiting the size of the desmetorexis is critical. Um, we know from series uh, published series already that um, a large size desmetorexis is, uh, is likely to fail in the short to medium term. So we keep all of our desmetorexis sizes to under 4 millimetres. Uh, when you're creating a four millimeter, essentially a four millimeter optical zone, then that has to be centered well, and, and that's something that we've uh, we've come to learn as well. Um, so pre-op centration of the or marking the pre-op pupil center is, I feel, an important step. Um, it's very important to peel, not scrape, uh, in creating the desmetorexis, and we'll go on to discuss that again in a second. And at all times to avoid engaging stroma and inciting a healing response from uh, keratocytes. Just to cover that point about scraping, ra peeling rather than scraping, um, we did some in vitro analysis of wound creation in this surgery, and here's a, a specular microscope uh, uh, picture of a wound that has been um, uh, scraped uh, to create the uh, desmetorexis. And you can see there's a, a trench created in the stroma, which those endothelial cells will now have to migrate over. Um, there's destruction and loss of cells um, on the uh, host side of the wound as well as the, the centre of the wound uh, which has been stripped away and if you compare that to a um, cornea that has had the uh, desmetorexis peeled um, you can see there's a clean cut with preservation of healthy cells right up into the, uh, right up into the edge of the wound. Fairly early in the process we realised there was a need for a pair of blunt grasping forceps um, and we looked at designing our own. There are, is a pair available from uh, MST. Uh, these are Hoffman Decimase stripping forceps which is what we now use for this operation. Um, Mike Stryko has a similar uh, pair of forceps with a blunt round tipped edges that he uses in uh, he creating his desmetorexis and I believe Mark Gorovoy is now also designing a um, set of forceps that custom made for this operation as well. So there are options for you to choose but I think the main principle is um, have something that is uh, small, uh, blunt tipped and can grasp the uh, decimase membrane rather than relying on a reverse Sinsky hook. Moving on to show a video of a typical case now. Um, I do make an attempt to mark pupil centre before uh, the patient comes into the theatre and then the patient is dilated to allow a better red reflex for uh, viewing decimase membrane. Using calipers we mark 3 to 4 millimetre um, area so we know we're not uh, overreaching. <coughs> I do use a reverse Sinsky hook just to gently initiate a tear in decimase membrane in one location off the, the visual axis. Then uh, these are the um, Hoffman decimase stripping forceps available from MST. Um, and we grab that small tag of uh, folded decimase membrane and then begin to initiate a, a tear. This is all done under Helon. It will often break, and if it does, um, I just gently fold down the lip of the um, the torn decimase, not attempting to initiate a new tear in another location, but just to reflect that decimase edge and gently grasp it again to complete the um, the uh, circular decimeterexis. goes without saying during the case that um, we're very careful to avoid engaging stroma in any way. 
on exiting the eye, um, care is taken not to drag along the temporal cornea as you as you exit. Helon is evacuated, and that's the uh, that's the operation. Typical surgery time is about uh, six minutes. And here's the post-op appearance at, of that patient at uh, at three months. Things that we are looking for when the, when the cornea has cleared is that the um, the decimeter axis is well centered over the pupil and uh, there's no stromal scarring or nodule formation. So apart from a delayed healing, what else could go wrong? We have seen some things. Uh, this is why we make an effort to center the rexus now. Um, it, here's a, a three millimeter area strip, but um, the area bisects the pupil and this patient um, uh, achieves 20-25 vision, but not 20-20. And we wonder, had we stripped the whole visual axis, would that be different? Uh, we were so concerned about not um, uh, scoring stroma after some of our earlier cases that uh, at one point I attempted to initiate the um, decimeter axis with forceps alone. And um, uh, that is possible as, as shown in this video. And, and um, uh, the case proceeded in a way that we thought was um, uh, to plan. When the cornea did clear though, you can see that we've actually grabbed stroma in that initiating location and left a stromal tag, which is now, um, because that's not papered over with a graft, a DMEC or a DSEC graft, um, that uh, area of scarring will stay and has stayed now for many months. Because it's off the visual axis, this patient has improved to 20-20 vision um, and is happy with the outcome, but um, it's lucky that that was not uh, central. To illustrate that point just even further, here's a patient who um, was slow to clear um, in our original study and had focal edema persisting over the visual axis for, for quite some time. Um, and when we did a, a achieve clearance with the use of a rock inhibitor, you can see that there is a, a an arcuate um, stromal scar uh, in a location that um, the stroma was scraped with a reverse Sinsky hook. It really doesn't take much to leave a um, or provoke a scarring response um, from the stroma in this surgery. Something curious that you will see if you do enough of these surgeries are these small uh, nodules that appear at the um, uh, border of the um, uh, stripped area, particularly if you scrape rather than peel the decimeter axis. Uh, these posterior stromal nodules um, will fade over time. You can see here um, in the photo and in OCT images at the immediate post-op period and, and four years post-op, they do become less noticeable. Uh, Jod Meta and I were discussing this and he feels this represents epithelial mesenchymal transformation. I don't believe there's any operation we do to the cornea that's truly refractively completely neutral and, and DWEC is not either. Um, what happens is interesting, you often see as the endothelial cells begin to pump more effectively over the stripped area, a thinning of the cornea. Um, here you can see centrally uh, the topography or tomography pre-op um, and to the left post-op and on the right the difference map. There's a Effectively, you create a almost a, a thinned uh, myopic ablation zone, um, and that's why I believe it's important to make this symmetrical and centered over the visual axis. Um, um, and we do see some small hyperopic shifts in these cases. Postoperatively, patients receive topical antibiotic uh, four times daily, and initially we continued that for a week, but. Um, we have to remember that in the presence of microcystic edema, which these patients will have for a period of time postoperatively, that's a break in their epithelium that's inviting infection. So we may continue that um, if there's considerable microcystic edema persisting for, for several weeks or months. Um, the uh, topical um, hypertonic saline we also use um, to limit that um, uh, edema in the postoperative course until they are clear and topical steroid we don't feel needs to continue for a prolonged period we, we leave that in place only for a week. Um, rock inhibitor is used in the setting of our current clinical trial. The main problem we have still with this operation is knowing which patients are going to respond quickly and which patients will respond but slowly and which patients won't respond at all to the to the operation. Um, Kathy Colby in her study coined the, the term fast, slow and non-responders, which I think is useful in the discussion uh, around this operation. That, that variability means two things. It means that every time a new modification to this operation is proposed as an accelerant of healing, and that includes rock inhibitors, it will take 
uh, a larger large series and um, detailed analysis to determine if that change is or if that intervention is significant or if we're just seeing a fast responder emerge from a cohort. Um, the second uh, problem that it creates is um, counselling a patient about what to expect after the surgery and the challenge that we have to overcome is to um, select um, or identify uh, the best candidates for this surgery preoperatively. You would think that there are certain things that should emerge with time as we continue analysis and they would, would probably be a younger age, uh, healthier or higher peripheral endothelial cell count, perhaps a, um, a, a more favourable genotype with less TCF4 uh, trinucleotide repeat expansions. But um, at the moment, we're st that, that, that uh, information is still uh, being sifted out. With regard to the use of ROC inhibitors as an adjuvant to this surgery, uh, we have found this to either be an extremely effective intervention or sometimes not um, uh, seem to make a great deal of difference. And we do have a case now proceeding to DMEC uh, despite uh, the use of a ROC inhibitor. Um, so studies into this are ongoing and we have much to learn. So what do I actually say to a patient when we're considering this, this surgical option? Uh, the, the term I use is we'll be taking one step backwards to go two steps forwards. The vision is going to get worse for a period of time, hopefully weeks only, um, until it clears up and becomes better. Um, patience is required from the patients for a visual result and the commitment to come back to you for, uh, for monitoring um, after the operation. The potential benefits are that the surgery is very fast, um, very little chance of inducing a, a cataract, uh, very little need for or for post-operative steroid, unlike obviously in the case of a transplant. Um, the unknowns are the expected duration of a, of a visual result or a surgical result after this procedure. Um, that's going to be defined only with, with more time. Um, I make the point that we haven't cured you of the genetic condition, we've just reset a degenerative process to an earlier, an earlier time and a graft may be required in any case. It is important to know that um, the outcomes of DMEC after a failed DWEC don't appear to be compromised in early um, analysis uh, from various centres performing the surgery. That's more than enough on, on DWIC and so just to finally sign off, um, uh, I'd like to uh, uh, thank the uh, Sydney Hiles Hospital Foundation again for supporting this work and to invite anybody uh, interested in attending our Sydney DMIC course. It's run in January or February uh, every year at Sydney High Hospital and um, we'd love to see uh, more people come and, come and attend. Uh, thanks very much for, for listening and I hope this has been of, of some help.